Good morning, Calvary. Great to see you here this morning virtually. Glad to have you tune in for your word for the day today. You know, one of the things I love most about studying scripture, apart from getting to know God and drawing closer to him, is seeing our life reflected in the events and moments of scripture. Because it's not disconnected from reality, even if it is thousands of years old in its writing. And I say this because today we're looking at the confrontation of two very estranged family members. These two brothers were separated and didn't speak for over 20 years. And the last time they were together, one of them promised to kill the other for what he had done. This event may have happened many, many years ago, but I can tell you it's playing out with a different family in different situations all over our nation and world today. And maybe you even find yourself in this story a little bit. But this has been building for a long time. See, last week I shared from chapter 32 how Jacob was afraid of this homecoming because he had done wrong so many years ago. And this caused his brother Esau to promise to kill Jacob over it. And they departed with that as a lasting memory. And now Jacob was fearful and anxious of this homecoming and reunion, so much so that he not only prayed to God, but then also strategized safety and contingency plans but then we also saw on Friday's episode that he spent the night wrestling with God over this. But chapter 33 meet, greets us with the news of these brothers reuniting. And let's take a look at what happens here. So chapter 33 of Genesis, verse 1, it says, And Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants. He put the servants with their children in front and Leah and her children and Rachel and Joseph last of all. And he went on before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. There's some, some tension, some, some worry, some stress there. Jacob is expecting the worst and just trying everything he can to protect his family and also to find favor. But verse four, it continues, it says, but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept there together. And that went better than maybe anyone was expecting. Jacob approaches with this posture of humility and repentance over the actions he had taken against his brother so many years ago. And Esau responds with forgiveness with an intentional dismissal of his previous threats of violence. And what follows is this beautiful reconciliation of these brothers. Esau asked to, to meet the, you know, his brother's wives and children and, and family, and there's this, this meeting and sharing of life. But as Jacob insists on blessing his brother, he makes a statement that I think is important to us. In verse 10, he says, I've seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you've accepted me. Now, initially that may sound strange, but I think there's something very important under this. I believe what Jacob is, is affirming there is, is that the face of Eli had, or of Esau rather, had been changed. His emotions, his expressions, his personality reflect God changing Esau's life and making him into a new person. And that very visibly changed his own expressions and countenance. And Jacob as well had experienced a big life change. We've been on a journey the last several chapters looking at the spiritual journey that Jacob was on. While he doesn't say that his face was different, the fact is that Jacob is a different person here than the one who lied and cheated his brother back in chapter 27. And this is a beautiful and wonderful reminder of a few things. First, God is in the business of changing lives. You may not think that you can change your life, or maybe you don't think he can change the life of a friend or family member, if that's the case, you'd be incorrect in that assumption. The truth is that only God can change lives. You can't change your life via willpower or self-help or motivation. You also can't change other people's lives, no matter how insistent you are, how much help you offer or give, or how much you nag them. Life change only comes through Jesus in a relationship with Him. This is also a reminder that it's never too late to reconcile with those who are far away. 2 Corinthians chapter five remind us that, that through Jesus, God reconciled us to himself. And it says he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So if you're estranged from a family member or friend, take some time today to pray. Pray first for reconciliation. Pray that God would restore you and redeemed what has been broken by sin. 
Pray for yourself that you would see and repent to the ways you contributed to that problem and that you would be made into a new person more like Jesus. Finally, pray for the other person, that God would be at work in their life, that God would bless them and soften their heart towards you and toward the situation. Today, I hope that this passage is a great reminder to you of God's power in our life and his ability to redeem and restore our lives no matter how bad it may be or how long it has been because God is in the business of changing lives. He wants to change your life. He wants to change the lives of the people around you. And he wants to be at work redeeming, restoring, and reconciling things that have been broken. So let this be an encouragement to you today. Hope you have a great day. We'll see you next time.